Welcome to Canon Conversation. Today we're going to cover an article that was written, uh, published yesterday by uh, Jeffrey Greider, G-R-I-D-E-R, -E Jeffrey Greider. Title is, Contrary to what the hyper-dispensationalists tell you, the body of Christ began at the cross and not somewhere in the book of Acts, and it's before Paul. So, uh, the position of this writer, who I believe is um, follows Peter Ruckman, is that the that the uh, cross be, the body of Christ began at the cross, and what we say, and they call us hyper dispensationalists, is that the body of Christ began with Paul in Acts chapter nine. And so let's look at uh, what he says in this article. Talk about that. He says uh, that Romans sixteen seven. Paul himself tells you in Romans sixteen seven that there were many people in the body of Christ before he was. But uh, Romans 16, 7 does not say that. Uh, Romans 16, 7 says, he, he mentions a couple of people and he calls them my kinsmen who were also in Christ before me. Doesn't say they were in the body of Christ before him. It says they were in Christ before me big difference and basically what I say and what we're going to see today is that in the beginning Genesis 1 1 God created the heaven and the earth and God reconciles the heaven back to himself through the body of Christ and then he which is us the people saved in the dispensation of grace starting with Paul and going into the rapture and then God reconciles the earth back to himself through the bride of Christ which is Israel so those who are saved in Israel's program from Genesis 12 through uh, Acts 7 and then again after the rapture uh, when um, God resumes Israel's program until Jesus' second coming. That would be the bride of Christ. Well, the way it works is that if you are, if you are a man and you marry a woman, uh, Genesis 2 says when Adam and Eve were married, marriage really means one. The two become one. Uh, the two become one flesh and so when Jesus marries his bride at the marriage supper of the Lamb at Jesus second coming then the bride of Christ become one with Christ now we today in the dispensation of grace are the body of Christ and Christ is the head so the body is uh, one with the head and uh, the bride when, he, when she marries the husband then she is one with the husband and so, whether the point is whether you're part of the bride of Christ, Israel, or you are the body of Christ, uh, Gentiles, then you are in Christ. So this writer here, this Jeffrey Greider, says that Romans 16, 7, Paul says there were many people in the body of Christ before he was. But that verse doesn't say that. It says, my kinsmen who were also in Christ before me. He doesn't say the body of Christ, it said in Christ. And my point is that the bride of Christ is just as much in Christ as the body of Christ is in Christ. The two become one at marriage. And so the kinsmen, which would be Jews, because Paul was a physical Jew, a Pharisee of the Pharisees. And so my kinsmen, he's talking about Jews who were in Christ before him, but they were in Christ in the bride. In uh, 1 Peter 3.16 and also 1 Peter 5.14, Peter writing to Israel, Israel's program, he talks about them in those two verses, 1 Peter 3.16 and 1 Peter 5.14. He refers to believing Israel as being in Christ. So it's not just believers today in the dispensation of grace who are in Christ. The believers in Israel's program are also in Christ. It's just they are in Christ as the bride of Christ, and we are in Christ as the body of Christ. Uh, so Paul doesn't say as this writer claims that these people his kinsmen were in the body of Christ before he was they were just simply in Christ before he was and they would have been in Christ in the bride okay then the uh, next one he mentions Ephesians 2 16 that he might reconcile both both Jew and Gentile unto God in one body by the cross having slain the enmity thereby the enmity being the law um, because we're guilty under the law. Well, what he's talking about there is in this current dispensation. 
mean, Ephesians 3 is going to talk about the mystery given unto him. And so when he's saying reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, it simply means, because two, verse, two verses before that, in Ephesians 2, 14, he says that the middle wall of partition between Jew and Gentile has come down. In Israel's program, Israel was above the nations, Deuteronomy 7 says. They were given favor nation status by God. The oracles of God, the Mosaic law, were committed to Israel. The miracles, the signs, the prophets, the kings, the judges, everything that God was doing, he was doing to Israel. He wasn't doing it to the Gentiles. But And even Jesus said in John 4, 22, salvation is of the Jews. When the Syrophoenician woman in Matthew 15 desired uh, to get a miracle from Jesus, Jesus wouldn't even speak to her because he said, at first anyway, because he said in Matthew 15, 24, I am not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And uh, Jesus basically says that the Gentiles in that program at that time were dogs compared to Israel, which were the children. Uh, Israel had favored nation status. So when you get to the dispensation of grace, though, Paul says that there is no respect of persons with God in this dispensation. Both the Jew and the Gentile are considered um, the same. They are not. The Gentile isn't treated any better than the Jew and vice versa. And so that's all that means when he says in Ephesians 2.16 that he might reconcile both Jew and Gentile unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. It means that today in the dispensation of grace, a Jew does not have to go to a Gentile to find out how he's saved, just like the opposite was true under Israel's program where the, where the, uh, the Gentile had to go to the Jew to be saved. What he's saying here, the, uh, gen, the Jew does not have to go to the Gentile to be saved in the dispensation of grace because we are all one. The middle wall of partition is down. In Ephesians 2.12, he talks about the time past when the Gentiles were uh, in Israel's program. It says, at that time, ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. And then in verse 16, when he says he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, what it's really saying is that the Gentiles um, no longer have to go through the Jew to be saved like they did before. In time past, at that time, you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. But now, you're not like that because Jesus, you could go to Jesus Christ directly when you recognize your sin and trust in Jesus' death, burial and resurrection as atonement for your sin. God gives you eternal life. You don't have to go to the Jew to find out what to do to be saved. That's all he's saying there. It's not saying the bride of Christ does not exist. It doesn't say that a dispensational change was made at the cross. Um, it's just saying that now, at the time that Paul writes to the Ephesians, there is the middle wall partition between Jew and Gentile has come down. It doesn't specify when that took place. It's just saying now it's already happened. And then uh, the next one was... Uh, what was Jesus doing on the cross, he says? Well, lots of things. First of all, Jesus went to the cross to make a payment for sin. And that payment is the shed blood of God, as we see in Acts 20, 28. That payment is the thing that makes reconciliation between lost sinners and holy and a holy and righteous God possible. Um, yes, that's true. That has nothing to do with the difference in um, dispensations and when that took place. The, um, one of the big objections that most people have when it comes to right division is they think that what we're saying, you see, what we're saying is there are two different Gospels. We're saying that in Israel's program, they needed to uh, recognize their sin and trust in God to save them. Um, recognize they're under the Mosaic Law and uh, not trust in their own righteousness and their own good works to save them, but trust in God to save them. And then when you get to Matthew, they also had to be water baptized to identify themselves with the believing remnant. So that's that was the gospel to Israel. The gospel to us today is recognize your sin, trust in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection as atonement for your sin. So because we say that the blood is what you trust in to be saved today, but the blood is not what Israel trusted in to be saved, then they, then they assume that what we're saying is that the blood of Jesus Christ was not shed for Israel. It was only shed for us today. And so I think that's why he's mentioning this.
and when the blood is shed at the cross, well, that begins a new dispensation because now people are saved by the blood of Christ. But what we're saying, though, is not that. What we're saying, the blood of Christ is always the means by which you are saved. Hebrews says the blood of bulls and goats is not sufficient to cover sins. It took the sacrifice of Jesus Christ once for all. So if you're Adam, you're Noah, you're Moses, you're Enoch, you're Job, you're um, Joshua, uh, whoever you are, even if you're in that Old Testament, even though the blood of Christ has not been shed yet, there is still, um, it's the means by which anybody is saved. So the gospel, the message that you believe in order to be saved is different depending on when you live. But the means by which you are saved is always the blood of Christ. So Israel, let's say Moses. So Moses, what he did is he didn't trust in the Egyptian gods and the Egyptian religion to save him. He recognized he was a sinner and he trusted in God to save him. He did not trust in the blood of Christ to save him. But Hebrews 11 says that Moses was in Christ. Because what God does is, he says, Okay, Moses, you believe the gospel that I gave you. Therefore... I am going to have the blood of Christ atone for your sins. Even though it hadn't been shed yet, I'm going to have the blood of Christ atone for your sins. Because Revelation 13, 8 says that the Lamb was slain from the foundation of the world. As far as God is concerned, the foundation of the world was built upon the cornerstone of the slain Lamb. The blood is what kept that, is the foundation. And that's why the foundation is sure that it will never go away. Because the blood of Christ never goes away. The whole earth is built upon that foundation. So even though they didn't know, now he couldn't reveal that as the gospel. Because 1 Corinthians 2, 7 says, if the princes of this world knew it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Uh, you know, that, that the plan of God was for Jesus to die on a cross. So the gospel before Acts 9 was not trust in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection as atonement for your sin because they didn't know that yet, because it wasn't revealed yet, because if it had been revealed, Satan would not have had Jesus killed on a cross. So the gospel to Abraham was trust to make sure your seed is numerous as the stars in heaven. Uh, it was also to sacrifice Isaac upon the altar. For Moses, it was trust in God to save you here and bring into the promised land. Same thing for Israel coming out uh, of Egypt, trusting God to bring into the promised land. But once they do that, then God takes the blood of Christ and atones for their sins. So we're not saying when we say, see what, but it seems like this writer, this Jeffrey Grider, what he's saying is that the blood of Christ does not atone for sins until um, the cross. And so that's why he makes a big deal out of, I would think, why he makes a big deal in saying the current dispensation began at the cross. Because according to his view of us, then by us saying that the gospel of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection is atonement for sin doesn't take place uh, or isn't in effect until Paul in Acts 9, then what we may be saying is that the blood of Christ is not what saves us, uh, the people who were after the cross and until Acts 9. And that's not what we're saying. It doesn't matter, it doesn't matter when you live. Adam, Adam trusted God. Adam is saved by the blood of Jesus Christ shed on the cross for his sins. He didn't believe that message, but the means by which he was saved was the blood of Christ. You know, if I have a kid and I tell the kid I'll give him a new car uh, when he graduates from high school and gets all A's in his, in his senior year in, in high school, well, the, the message that he believes is good, good grades. But the means by which I give him that car isn't by his good grades. His good grades didn't buy it. It was, I worked a job and I got money and I used the money to buy the car. So the gospel was get good grades. The means by which he gets the car is by me paying for it through the job that I worked. So God says the good news, the gospel to Israel is don't trust in your own righteousness. Don't trust in your own religion. Recognize your sin. Trust in God to save you. And the means by which he would save them is by the, the payment of the blood of Christ purchased with his own blood. Um, 
and that uh, because of the fact that the cross was not revealed until uh, Paul because they would not have crucified the well the cross was revealed to the apostles in Matthew 16 for the first time but the the cross being revealed as God's plan to save man isn't revealed until you get to Paul as the gospel I should say the gospel until you get to Paul um, and a good illustration is in Matthew 20 28 Jesus says the son of man gives his life a ransom for many but in 1 Timothy 2, 6, Paul says that Jesus Christ gave his life a ransom for all to be testified in due time. So it was originally revealed that Jesus would give his life for many, the many of Israel who would believe, trust in God to save them. But then in due time, it's testified that he really gave his life a ransom for all, not just the many in Israel. Uh, so... Then, uh, let's see, he also says, um, secondly, he says, Jesus shed blood on the cross, established something on, the, on this earth the Bible calls the body of Christ. And I want to make the point that that's not what it did. Remember, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. God's not establishing the body of Christ on the earth. Ephesians 1 3 says that we are blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Ephesians 2 5 and 6 says we are quickened together with Christ and he's made us sit together in with him in heavenly places Philippians 3 20 and 21 says our conversation is in heaven from whence we look for the Savior the Lord Jesus Christ so our the body of Christ is not on this earth it is in heaven contrast that with um, believe in Israel believe in Israel Revelation 5 verse 10 Revelation 5 10 says that God has made us to be um, kings and priests and we shall reign with him on the earth so in in eternity God has Israel's program and Jesus Christ rules the entire universe from the earth sitting on the throne in Mount Zion in Jerusalem on the earth and then uh, the body of Christ is in heaven. So, now remember, we're all one in Christ. Remember, the bride is one because they marry Christ. The body, of course, is one with the head. So we're all one in Christ. And when, but when Jesus Christ is going to be ruling heaven and earth from the earth, and we as the body of Christ will be ruling in heavenly places, Israel as the bride of Christ will be ruling on the earth. So, when the bride... And so then that's why John 1.51 says that you'll see the Son of Man and angels ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Well, he's on the earth, so the angels ascend from him to go to heaven as the body of Christ has instructed them to do something there. And then they descend upon him as the bride of Christ, Israel, has given instructions there. So the idea that the shed, Jesus shed blood on the cross established something on this earth, the Bible calls the body of Christ, is incorrect. The body of Christ is in heaven. The bride of Christ is on the earth. And so when you understand that, that makes sense why you've got two different programs, two different um, sets of believers here, and two different gospels. Uh, he says about, um, uh, let's see, he says in Acts 7, uh, when Israel did not believe when they stoned Stephen, it says it simultaneously put the kingdom of heaven on a 2,000 year pause and ushered in what we call the dispensation of the church age. Well, now it seems like he's the right divider. I mean, that's exactly what we say is that the kingdom of heaven for Israel was put on hold and has been at least a 2,000 year pause at the stoning of Stephen. So it seems like he's contradicting himself there and the dispensation of the church age. Well, it's the dispensation of the body of Christ. And the body of Christ is the church. He mentions Ephesians 1, 22 and 23, the church which is his body. Well, that's what it is today. The church today is the body of Christ. But the church in Israel's program is the bride of Christ. Just because the church is identified as his body in Ephesians 1, 22 and 23, doesn't mean that a reference to the church in Acts 7, when it talks about the church in the wilderness under Moses, doesn't mean that's his body. It was, it was the bride of Christ back then. Uh, he says, 
from this point on, Jesus from the cross, or I'm sorry, from Acts 7, from this point on, G Jews will be side by side with Gentiles in a mystery called the body of Christ, which Jesus will task Paul with revealing. It didn't start with Paul, but the knowledge of it comes through Paul by the Spirit. It began on the cross of Calvary. So, you know, he, he says it began on the cross of Calvary, but yet he recognizes a change in Acts 7. So it's like the mystery was revealed through Paul, starting in Acts 9, as a result of the stoning of Stephen in Acts 7. But yet it was still body of Christ before then, which doesn't make any sense. Because Jesus continues to focus in the red letters on the kingdom. He keeps talking about the kingdom of heaven. Um, so why... You know, and only go to Israel, only go to the Jews, is what he's saying. So why would he talk about, you know, um, why would he talk about that? But he's really, it's really the body of Christ because after the cross it started. That doesn't make any sense. Uh, let's see what else we've got here. Uh, 1 Timothy 1.16, I wanted to mention that it says that, Paul says that in me first, Jesus Christ might, for show, might show forth all long suffering as a pattern to them which should hereafter believe. So it shows that something new started with Paul. It's not just the message is now revealed, the mystery is now revealed, but he says, in me first, Jesus Christ shows forth all long suffering as a pattern to them which should hereafter believe. Um, and then let's see if I got anything else. Uh, he says, Paul was given the job of revealing the mystery of the body of Christ, but it did not start with him, as you can obviously see. Obviously see, I, I don't see that, I saw. 1 Timothy 1.16, that in me first, Jesus Christ. Uh, he says, rightly dividing is done on a verse-by-verse -verse basis anywhere in the Bible, comparing what you read and the context that you find it to what God has written through the Apostle Paul. That's exactly what we do as a right divider. They accuse us of not rightly dividing the word of truth. But what we do is we say 2 Timothy 2.7. Paul says, consider what I say and the Lord give the understanding in all things. So with the knowledge that we have of the mystery revealed to Paul, then we rightly divide by on a verse-by-verse -verse basis anywhere in the Bible, compare what we read to the context to find out what it means. <laughs> so it's funny that he accuses us, starts the article, and he entitles it, um, the body of Christ began at the cross and not somewhere in the book of Acts, and it's before Paul. And then it's like the last half of the article, he switches to our position. So... Um, so he just contradicts himself within the own, his own article. Thanks for watching. Oh, by the way, I'll put the link to this article in the YouTube description so you can read it. Thanks.